Excuse me while I powder my fly, ladies. One, one moment. <clears throat> I'll be right back. Cha-ching! Welcome back to another Tactical Fly Fisher on the Water video today. Uh, we are at a small stream and we came here specifically in hopes that we'll have a good bait us hatch today. It's pretty much the worst bait us conditions you could have. It's going to be bright sun, but the one thing about this river is that it's in a uh, pretty deep canyon, so we may be able to find some places later when it's still warm uh, that are in the shade and, and sometimes the bait us will still pop kind of like it's a cloudy day in those shaded sections. So. We'll see if that's the case, and we're hoping really to, to find some dry fly fishing because we've had some good dry fly fishing elsewhere lately, and uh, this is often a good time of the year to come do that here. So, uh, but in the morning, we're probably going to have to nymph, and that's totally fine. Um, we're going to mess around with uh, some different sink rates of nymphs that are also with the same bead size. So, one thing that needs to be emphasized a lot when you're picking your nymphs is the sink rate of that nymph based on the body style that it is. So uh, depending upon how that goes today, we'll break that down a little bit more and make it a focus for you. And uh, hopefully you can understand a little bit more about choosing the right nymph based on sink rate as well as the right weight uh, when it comes to picking your flies. So we're gonna go have some fun, hopefully catch some brown trout and uh, we'll see how the day goes. So we took a little quick walk downstream and I've intentionally tried to walk past some water to see where I might see fish because this river's got a lot of fish in it and a lot of times they're out in pretty shallow exposed water, at least when they're hard on the feed. But it's, you know, the morning has started off kind of cold. Uh, it's pretty early, it's like 9.30. So uh, we're a long ways from the beta hatch starting so far. And all the fish that I've spooked in shallow water so far have been pretty much buried under rocks. So, <laughs> so we're gonna come start at this a uh, little more of a wintering holding pool where maybe some fish are out more willing to, to eat don't have their heads buried and then as the water warms up hopefully we'll see some fish in other areas so we'll uh, go give this a try i've got a micro leader with a dry just a little parachute mayfly and a, a betis paradigon below it i think it's a two and a half mil bead inverting bead and uh, we'll start there and see if I need to adjust weight or length. 
Haven't seen anybody at the back of the pool like I expected. They seem to uh, be pretty sulky and hiding out this morning. There's a fish, little guy. <laughs> really little guy. Uh, I haven't ticked bottom and through most of it yet, uh, except at the very, very rear, and I didn't see any fish at the tail out. So I feel like a lot of them are probably up in that slower head of it, which is a lot deeper. So I'm going to make a few more casts with this rig, and if I don't get anything else, we'll uh, start changing things and get a little bit deeper. There we go. Rig drifted a little bit further back into the sort of shallower midsection of the pool and whoops. This guy pulled that dry down really quickly. Not the uh, largest fish we're gonna see today hopefully, but bigger than the first one at least. See you later. And when I'm fishing this dry dropper rig, I make that cast. I'm trying to get almost all of my leader off of the water. I've got just a couple inches of tippet near the dry fly that's on the water still, but I'm high sticking pretty much all the rest of it off. And given the short range that I'm fishing uh, in this smaller river, that's not too hard to do. And you can see I'm just uh, making that upstream cast, but I'm hand twisting line back in for my slack retrieval. Otherwise, you just have to keep raising that rod and eventually it gets way up over your head and you can't control the drift or set the hook anymore. You don't want that. So I'm just keeping pace up with that drift with that hand twist. So far, it looks as though I am not quite deep enough with how lethargic and uh, bottom hugging the fish seem to be so far. They're not coming up through the column for the nymph, so it's time to make a switch after this cast. All right, I'm just gonna cut the dry fly off. We'll go to a single nymph. I still have some Scafars wax up here from when I was fishing it the other day with a single nymph. I may uh, reapply it to make it a little bit uh, deeper. Um, and we'll just try a single nymph first. If that doesn't work, I'll go to two nymphs and we'll go from there. There we go. So, a little bit of an added trick on that one. Like I said, I, I just have a single nymph on so far. I drifted through that spot a couple times, just with standard dead drifts. I got to where my cider was drifting nice and slow, it looked like my fly was down near the bottom, but I hadn't had any grabs yet, so I just lifted the rod tip about two inches and dropped it right back down. And instantly, as soon as I did that, cider jumped and uh, this fish had taken. Another nice, uh, you know, they're not terribly big so far, but uh, a little 10 inch brown or so. Good way to start the day. And we already did see our first uh, betas. So hopefully that is a harbinger of good things to come. So we had to skip a little bit of this in-between water because we had a friend come down to the river who just uh, decided to take selfies everywhere right over the river. <laughs> so he's probably spooked some of it. But then I slowed down up here. What I do a lot 
in this river and similar sized rivers, when I got clear water like this, I like to stock some of this water that I can see through and see if I can spot fish first. And this river I can normally spot a lot, but so far I have spotted almost nothing until a very small fish right here. But um, since it's there, I'm gonna go try and catch it. I switched up. I now have a two millimeter bead uh, waltz worm on. It's really shallow water. The waltz worm has a little bit of kind of shaggy fur on it. Just hair's ear dub. It's gonna slow the sink rate, kind of like a soft tackle, but almost in between. And then with the two mil, hopefully I'll be about the right sink rate to hit this fish. We'll give it a go and see what happens. All right, just got the fly out of the tree there. If you wanna know how I did it, we have a video about that. <laughs> Jiggling it out. It's kind of a tight spot. There we go. So, quick explanation on that one. I, uh, see you later fish. So I started off in this spot with the soft tackle uh, betis nymph that I had been fishing down below. And after about three or four casts of drifting through there, I could tell it was kind of just shooting through wasn't getting down. That's fairly deep and a lot more turbulent than what we had below. So I switched back to that two and a half mil inverting bead uh, Peridagon, the, the betas one that I'd started with originally down there. And uh, a couple casts in, I got deep enough and pulled that last fish pretty much off the front side of the rock that's at the, the back of this little pool here. Um, classic holding lie, but I didn't get it with the original nymph that I had on and I switched. And yeah, this, this nymph is a little bit heavier just by the fact that it, I went to an inverting bead versus a slotted bead. But the main thing that it has is the Peridagon body that's smooth. It doesn't catch current or, or water as it's sinking and so it just has a faster sink rate. So that was what allowed me to get down for that fish where I wasn't able to do that with the soft tackled nymph below. So always keep that in mind as you're as you're making changes. Sometimes it's not like a whole bead size change that you need to go to. A lot of times just changing the style pattern to one that has a more or less streamlined profile will get you to the level that you want. Let's see if I can bow and arrow cast into that far side and pull a fish out there. Haha! <laughs> exactly how you always want it to play out. <laughs> there we go. Bow and arrow under the bush. And actually, the, I expected the take to come pretty quick, so there might still be another fish up further. Oh, he's got that fly buried in his pre-maxillary there. But uh, I expected that tick to come up at the top, but it had to drift it all the way to the rear again, but still under the trees when I caught this fish. So uh, we'll get him gone, and maybe we'll get another one out of there. We went ahead and moved spots because uh, we were seeing quite a few less fish at that last spot than I'm used to seeing here. And we came upstream a ways and uh, we walked downstream from the parking area to fish back up, but it's such a tight channel in here that we were spooking fish the whole way. And there was a pot of fish down here below me that I knew if I went and hopped in, they'd all blow up the top end of this pool. So I decided I'm just gonna forego those fish and we'll start here and uh, hopefully by the time we get back up to some of that other water, the fish that we've already spooked will have settled down, but we'll give it a go. And uh, I've got a nice 
tight canopy over me here, so it's going to be interesting casting conditions, but uh, we'll use some water loads and other stuff to try and keep it out of the trees and go from there. And there's a fish, first cast. And the exciting thing is, it's a cutthroat. That's cool. You don't get a lot of those in here. Ugh. This is a very much brown trout dominated stream, so whenever I can see a cutthroat in here, I get very excited. There it is. Not a large fish, but beautiful nonetheless. See you later, buddy. So, all I have on right now is just that single two and a half mil Perdigon that's beta style. And at least for that first fish, it seemed to be about right. I'll make a couple more drifts and see if uh, I tick bottom too early. Or there's another fish. Whoa, sorry, buddy. Can't really get my rod through the trees here. <laughs> a micro brown trout on a micro leader. A wonderful combination. Definitely a fish. <laughs> and as I suspected, a small one. <laughs> but at least I spotted it. And uh, I had to switch. I had on a 2.3 millimeter bead Paradigon. Let me wet my hands real quick. <sighs> Look at the little guy. <laughs> See you later, buddy. <clears throat> but I spotted that fish in there and uh, had on a two, three mil Paradigon. It would have been far too heavy for that really thin water there. So I put on that same soft tackle betas pattern I showed you earlier, but this one had a two millimeter bead and between the smaller bead and that soft tackle, it slowed the sink rate down enough that I was able to get that fish to eat and not get under him right away. So when you're looking at a, a fish you can see or even just a target lie that you're fishing, one of the big confusion points for a lot of people is how much weight you should have on or how fast your fly should sink. And I wanna always have my fly move through the area that I'm targeting before it ticks bottom. Because if it's ticking bottom before or right at that spot, then you're either under the fish or you're gonna spook them when you rip it off the bottom. So you wanna have it at their level, you know, close to the bottom, but at their level as it's coming near to them. So that means not putting on too much weight or a fly that sinks too fast if you're ticking bottom in a, in a spot like this. And certainly that water is only about a foot deep, maybe a little bit deeper. And so I certainly didn't need any more weight than what I had. Okay, let's go find some other fish. Yeah, that one took a little persistence. Yeah, there we go. So I spotted this thing up in this glide, I guess you could call it, kind of a deep glide. And he was not feeding hard. He was just kind of locked hard on the bottom. And uh, I went through three fly changes and Finally settled on a 2.3 millimeter bead waltz worm, and that's how I got him. Nice colored up brown trout. But, uh, yeah, I had to dial in the sink rate for that fish because I was watching my bead fall, and I'd watch the glint of it in the sun, and sometimes it was falling too fast and getting under him, and sometimes it was staying over his head, and he did not want to move. When I finally got the right drift with with that fly, you know, he came about an inch over, ate it, and that was it. So whenever you're sight fishing, dialing in that sink rate is very important. Yeah. First cast was a few inches off to the right. Didn't need it. Second cast on the money. 
Hey, uh, two millimeter bead quill to gone on that one. So back to a betas pattern. It was a, it was kind of like an in-between depth. It was, I don't know, maybe 18 inches of water, but it wasn't real fast. So I still needed a little bit of sink rate, not as much as a 2.3 or a 2.5 millimeter bead. Oh, look at the red spots on that fish. That's a stunner. See ya. But uh, that smooth Paragon body of the Quilagon helped me get down just at the right point for that fish. If I'd gone to a soft tackle or a dubbed version of the same weight, I probably would have still been over his head. But that choice right there was right on the money. I, oh yeah. Yes. If I'm gonna choose a, a sink rate or a weight, I want to be at the fish's level or slightly above. I don't want to be below because okay. remember that trout's eyes are just above the midpoint of their body. They're made to be able to see in that cone shape above their head. They're not made to be able to see below. They got to tilt, so it doesn't really do you any good if you're under them. And if it's falling out of the their sky, essentially, if it's falling through the column like a, a rock too, that just doesn't look natural. So you need it coming in fairly level, and then they're a lot more willing to eat it than if it's just going to crash under their body. There we go. Oh, he, did you see that other fish he kicked out from that rock? Get out of from under there, there we go, come on. Get out from there, nice. Yeah, that, so that fish was sitting under the rock he's been trying to get under. Sweet! Sweet. There he was. That didn't take long. About a foot of drift on the first cast. Sweet. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I'm glad you made the choice to throw the dry plan. I guess I'd rather be a little above them than below, you know? Yeah. Mm. He was bigger than I thought. <laughs> oh. oh, that was fun. <laughs> Let everybody know what just happened. Not a bad fish. Not bad. Time to let him go. It's on that last fish. We we're just creeping up the bank, looking for heads, looking for noses. Saw that fish coming up on the edge, just plain as day, right on a rock, sitting, feeding. And the first couple, the first cast I think I laid on him that looked okay, he just spooked off super duper hard. We're fishing like 6X and like a little CDC thing that didn't land hard. It didn't seem like he should have spooked. So we took our time, waited for about 30 seconds. He came trundling back, got back in the spot, watched him eat a couple times, made sure he's happy. Put a couple drifts and went right over top of him and he ate nothing, nothing, nothing. And then the third one that came off just for whatever reason in the right place, got him. So pretty sweet. We're glad we're finally seeing some betas like we hoped we'd see. Yeah, not a lot of heads yet, but uh, and I'm sure that the hatch is going to be pretty short window today with how sunny and hot it is. But hopefully we'll see at least a couple more risers before the day is done. Mm -hmm. And how? Let's get another.
Well, took a few casts, had to change flies again. I had that two millimeter bead Paragon on. Uh, it's real slow in there. And uh, I was just dropping under the fish really quickly. So I pulled that off, put on a two millimeter bead soft tackle betas again. And it's not a real big fish, but a fish nonetheless. There we go. Bye bye, little guy. Oh, just blew that cast. Okay, I'm gonna go to that one that's in the center. There we go. Oh, got him. Swam right over. I think actually see the white wink, but he just turned back the other way and I figured that was enough of an indication that he'd eaten my fly to set the hook. And there he is. Flies right in that corner. Even though it's barbless, it's been bedded pretty good. All right, there we go. See you later, fish. <laughs> Drag, unfortunately. Oh, oh, oh crap. Uh, oh, <laughs> Ching. Ooh, kill him. Oh, slap. Nice work. Well, this fish. I'd seen kind of suspended a few inches off the bottom over there on the bank for a while. And uh, the way he was acting, even though I hadn't seen him rise, I thought, that guy is willing to eat a dry fly. And guess what? It sure did. Thanks, Mr. Brown Trap. You're not big, but that was a beautiful rise. So this is the dry fly we've been using catch our fish today that we've caught on dries the one that I just caught that fish on and uh, it looks extra, extra fluffy right now because I just powdered it up but it's just a little CDC pattern um, cock to the on tail thread body a little pink yarn in the wing for visibility and then CDC facing forward kind of like a shuttlecock style so it's basically a CDC compared on but with the wing tilted further forward real simple I think this is a size 18 or 20 and uh, it's met the fancy of most of the baitis eaters today and the other day when I was out uh, during the baitis hatch. So these are the nymphs we've been uh, using today. I've got just a simple little waltz worm there. This is that soft tackle baitis nymph. It's uh, basically just thread body dubbing for the thorax and a little CDC soft tackle. we got a quildagon that's missing its tails now because they got chewed off by fish. And that's a little two mil version. And then uh, new uh, Betas Paradigon I've been working with. This isn't the exact one that I was catching fish on earlier because it broke off, but it's pretty much the same pattern. And then I've also had some unweighted versions of that pattern and that pattern that I've used when we've been in really shallow and uh, smooth water and targeting fish and that, that stuff as well. So having different styles of flies, you can see these two are straight Paradigons, so they sink really fast with not much weight. And then these two have either dubbing or soft tackle that slows that descent down. So even if you're fishing the same weight of uh, pattern, then they don't tend to sink as quickly. And you can tailor in your sink rates really well by having both styles of flies in uh, multiple weights. Perfect. Oh, off to the left by like six inches. And off to the, oop. Yeah, buddy. Cha-ching. Oh, you get back from behind that log. That is a nice fish. Whee! Oh, God. Too close. 
Yes, almost at your feet. Definitely out of the uh, the frame. But there we go. And sick dry fly eat. Oh. two fish that are up there behind the log, but they're in slightly more oh, aggressive current, but I still got that one. Little guy, but I'll take it. And that one ate a Virginia midge, which we didn't talk about in the little segment. But just so I'm not lying, whoops, this guy ate an unweighted Virginia midge. Is there a tutorial for the Virginia midge? I see there, there might be a tutorial for it. <laughs> I'll put it in the description below. Yeah. Thanks for watching this tactical fly fisher video. We really do appreciate it. If you enjoyed it, please give us that thumbs up. Help spread the love on the channel. Subscribe to the channel and uh, share the video with your friends. If you need any fly tying materials or equipment for your own trips to the water, come on over to tacticalflyfisher.com and we'll get you taken care of. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. I am powerless to stop what happens next. Man, it's a heady little shrine here. You ready? Oh my god, someone left a brand new pair of Costas sitting right here. Who would do that? <laughs>